Ladies and gentlemen, we've got, uh, we've got eight really high quality speakers here today. We're going to talk about four markets. We're going to start off with Australia. Uh, we're then going to, to work our way through into uh, the UK and Ireland before we go to North America and South America. Um, and we're going to have um, uh, each of uh, NZT people giving you an overview of the market, a quick snapshot of each of these markets before we get a business perspective about you know, the opportunities, maybe some of the lessons learned you know, when, when the businesses went into these markets and actually started to do the business. So um, it is going to be like speed dating. We're going to do five minute sessions for eight speakers uh, and then we're going to try and provide enough time at the end of the presentations uh, for a good conversation and questions as well. Uh, so look, the, the key thing that, that I would just like to reinforce in my role uh, is New Zealand's uh, Special Agricultural Trade Envoy is that we often talk about agri-tech from New Zealand. We often have a lower profile than many other countries in the world, like Israel, for example, that are very active promoting their wares around the world. But New Zealand has agri-tech that is world-class, uh, and, and in fact, I think that there are more opportunities for us to work together in many other markets of the world. We don't have all the answers, but you can adapt our agri-tech to different situations, different scenarios, uh, in a way that, that really is of benefits to both parties. So with those opening comments, I'm going to leave us to the, the expert speakers. We're going to go to Australia. Uh, we're going to get Cathy to come up and talk about uh, the Australian market. This is often a market uh, where people go to first. There's a lot of exchange happening in Australia, between Australia and New Zealand. Cathy's going to provide an overview before we move into the business perspective. Thanks, Cathy. Okay, so firstly a few um, brief um, facts and figures and then we'll look at opportunities in the market, um, opportunities in the market, how Agritech can provide solutions and some barriers to entry. I'll then be followed by Jonathan Stubbs from Shoof who will provide an in-market experience. Dairy herd. The dairy industry is predominantly located in southeast Australia with cooler conditions and high rainfall, where cooler conditions and high rainfall are conducive to production. Victoria is the main producing state where one million dairy cows, or 64% of the national herd, is located. There are just over 6,100 dairy, farm, dairy farms milking 1.5 million cows in Australia. There are just over 11,700 dairy farms milking 4.9 million cows in New Zealand. Australia exports 34% of its milk and represents 6% of world dairy products traded. New Zealand is the world's largest exporter and accounts for 38% of all dairy products traded internationally. The industry has declined in Australia in both the number of participants and total production levels in recent years. However, the number of large dairy farms, dairy farm businesses is, is growing at 11% per annum. These larger businesses spend large amounts on animal feed and nutrition and employing staff. Thus, there are opportunities to help these businesses increase in e efficiency of their feed systems and to achieve labour efficiencies, as this is where they may be able to reduce costs and improve profitability. Beef cattle. Australia has a total herd size of 23 million cattle, significantly larger than in New Zealand, where there's a herd of 3.6 million. Beef is grown across Australia, from high rainfall zones in southern Australia to the arid centre and the wet dry tropics in the north. Queensland has the largest herd with 11 million. There are two distinct industries. Southern Australia, high rainfall areas with more intensive pasture based production and a greater proportion of British breeds. And northern Australia, where very large farms are mostly commercial. Some farms in central Australia are over 1 million hectares. Queensland, the Northern Territory and Northern WA make up this industry. Sheep and lamb flock. Total, 
um, flock population in 20, 2016 was 66 million. Um, New Zealand sheep flock was 27 million. Both industries have declined dramatically since the 1990s. 26 million or 39% of sheep and lambs are in New South Wales, followed by Victoria with 13 million and WA with 12.8 million. In terms of opportunities for agriculture, the Australian industry cannot rest on its assumed superiority and quality and safety. There is an urgent and continuing need to improve biosecurity, product safety and quality, and ultimately industry productivity in order for the sector to remain profitable in the future. To achieve this will require coordinated efforts throughout the entire supply chain and the rapid emergence of digi digital technologies. The key challenges facing Australian farmers are competitive global markets and maintaining farm profitability. Australia has maintained productivity relative to other advanced economies, but we are losing ground to emerging major producers such as Brazil and China. We will need to innovate, do more with less, and unlock new sources of value to ensure our continued success. Agritech can help to improve on farm efficiency and decision making by um, automating routine tasks, regulations and compliance, and traceability and product assurance. Labour is one of the most significant costs for Australian farms. The impact of digi digital technologies on labour efficiency is likely to be the greatest in sectors that have routine tasks with a high degree of predictability and which need to be performed with a high degree of accuracy. Process automation, where sensors replace subjective human assessment of such things as animal health, will result in both labour efficiency increases and more accurate measurement leading to increased productivity. Regulations and compliance. One of the most common areas of labour saving will arise from the use of digital technologies for regulatory and compliance requirements. Meeting market and regulatory requirements is a major cost for many farmers. In some sectors, such as the livestock export industry, the regulatory burden has increased substantially in recent years. A common concern expressed by farmers in a range of sectors is that there is unnecessary duplication in compliance schemes and an over-reliance on traditional paper-based reporting. So digital systems provide more efficient ways of meeting information and compliance requirements through automated data collection and reporting which can reduce costs and make life easier for farmers. Traceability and assurance. Uh, digital, digital traceability and provenance systems are becoming increasingly important in maintaining and developing new high value markets and providing confidence for end users and consumers in relation to product safety and quality. Barriers to entry. Proximity and historical relations mean there are few barriers. Language is usually not an issue. Australians and New Zealand speak a similar language. But there are, but there are uh, a lot of differences. For instance, Australia's dairy sector is more reliant on bought-in feed. Climate in Australia is generally a lot drier. Also, there are differences in agricultural markets. For instance, New Zealand dairy processing is dominated by one large farmer-owned cooperative. Fonterra. Australian dairy processing is dominated by companies, including Fonterra, with high foreign ownership and cooperatives are a very small part of the processing market. Long distances between farms in rural areas of our wide brown, brown land make doing business expensive and labour intensive, particularly when compared to New Zealand. Telecommunications. The current existing telecommunication infrastructure may impose significant constraints to the potential utilisation of agricultural data technologies. 
Currently only a minority of farms have reliable mobile data coverage over their farm area and the National Broadband Network, the NBN, is still in the rollout phase. In addition, the, the adoption of on-farm telecommunication infrastructure is very limited, with a small proportion of farms having any radio links to devices and or mobile data linked devices. Um, data privacy, uh, data sorry, the collection rates of various agricultural data types are fairly low on Australian farms. Um, within the livestock industries, medication records, animal breeding data and individual animal or herd production data were reported as the most collected ag agricultural data, yet they were only collected by 63, 57 and 56 per cent of respondents respectively. So in terms of entering the market, communication of the value proposition that Agritech can provide is really important. Despite this relatively low data collection rates among Australian farmers, farmers report that any data that is collected is regarded as very useful in informing farm management decisions. So this underscores the importance of communicating the value proposition to farmers who are not yet collecting various types of agricultural data and, and working in that space. And data privacy. Farmers have, have concerns over risks of aggregated data in relation to privacy, financial advantage taken by other businesses and the potential for it to be used to influence markets, e.g. produce prices and land values. So producers need reassurance to address their concerns about how the aggregated data will be governed and used. Addressing transparency, privacy, data ownership and control will encourage farmers to share their data and in turn help realise the pot potential value of that data and how it can work for them. Um, there are a few helpful reports. Um, I'll be available after the presentation. Um, and I can point you in the direction of those reports. And over to John. <coughs> thanks, thanks, Cathy. Um, very useful, good overview and snapshot. Look, we're very grateful to have the business perspective coming in today as well, so in each of these markets. But John Stubbs, I'm going to shorten all the CVs just so that we can get through this in relatively good time. Born and raised on a dairy farm. Uh, in fact, a sheep, no, born, dairy farm. That's right, born and raised on a dairy farm. Uh, worked his way up, he's had a stint in tourism, rural banking, and he's now the general manager for Sheep International. Welcome, John. Thanks for your questions. Afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give a fairly uh, fairly honest and uh, no-holes-barred uh, take on on success in Australia. Shoof, for people that don't know Shoof, uh, we've been around for about 45 years. Uh, Shoof started uh, with uh, the owner of the company, Jeff Laurent, coming up with an idea, formulating that, taking it to market, and on the back of that has grown a, a multi-million dollar business. Shoof's got a fantastic story, it's got fantastic provenance. We've been in Australia, uh, prior to me taking it over, about 12 years. We came to Australia through acquisition, so we bought a couple of companies, bolted them together, and Shoof Australia was about to be born. So about uh, four and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to take Australia under my wing. Um, it had been going okay, but I, I think that in all, in all honesty, the board wasn't particularly happy with the return on investment and how we'd been going. So I'd been tasked with moving Australia forward. So in terms of, of what we do, we've got a range of agricultural ancillary on-farm products. We've got about 2,500 SKUs on offer. Our um, target market's rural industry, our customers are rural stores and the end users are farmers. So success for Shoof looks like lots of product in farm stores being sold to farmers. So there's four things I'm going to talk about today. Standing out in a crowded market, so what, why are you here, how are you going to make a difference? The challenge of HR in Australia and the challenge that that brings. The tyranny of distance, uh, Australia is a massive country, absolutely phenomenally massive. And tech transfer onto farm if I'm not cut off before my five minutes is up. 
So I was given the opportunity to uh, take over Australia, so I thought this is great. I'm going to go over there, I'm going to grab the uh, Australian by the uh, scruff of the neck. So I thought I'm going to pack my bags and Julie hopped on a plane and I decided I was going to live over there for uh, chunks at a time and really immerse myself in Australia. So I got over there, got to know the team, went out with the reps, got to know the customers, got on on farm, got to know the farm and I did this all around Australia, got into head offices and really tried to understand what is it that makes Australia tick. What is it that's different about Australia? And it was really interesting because you know we, we come from a country where from a business with a lot of a, a lot of provenance. And after 12 years being there, I thought people would have known who we were. But I had head officers saying to me, "But mate, you're just another trader. So what?" I'm sitting there going, "Another trader? We got 45 years history in New Zealand. What do you mean another trader? You don't know our story?" And they didn't. They didn't know our story. They didn't really care. So I came back, packed my bags came back, marched into Jeff's office and said, Jeff, I need a one to two page bio on who Shoof is. We need to take this to Australia. We've got to tell our story. We've got to link into the psyche of the people that make decisions. We're talking about farm store owners. We're talking about farmers. We're talking about head officers. We've got a great story. We need to tell it. Crickets for the next six months. Jeff is obviously a busy man. That's okay. I came and went and came back, went from Australia and time went on. Some six months later, Jeff presented me the book. So Jeff had gone away and written a book about uh, his life story at Shroof, which was a lot more than I expected, but extremely valuable because I could then take that book, I could take it to farmers, I could take it to farm stores, I could take it to head offices and tell the Shroof story. And it was really important because people, the light bulb went on. People went, ah, I understand. So you're from farming background. Ah, so, so you're owner operators like we are. You're not just a big corporate and a lot of light switches turned on and it just made the path to doing business so much easier. So make sure you understand your story if you're there. If you're there, do people really understand your story? And tell your story and tell your story proudly because I think that any entrepreneurial based business in New Zealand has a great story to tell. I think it's very important. Something else that worked for us is we, we re-engage with the customers. I was told by uh, one of our biggest customers, mate, your opposition comes to the opening of a letter. You're never there. I'm like, aren't we? No, you're never there, mate. So we started to go in the opening of every letter that went around. We invested in field days. We went to the conferences. We went to their trade shows. And we wrote out some serious checks to do so. And we invested some serious coin to do so. But the return was phenomenal because it showed the market that you were prepared to invest in them, you were prepared to support them, and by that mere effect alone, they supported us in turn. And that in itself, the story, our provenance, and investing in them, investing in, in their industry, paid dividends for us. HR, are there any Australians in the room other than Cathy? <laughs> okay, I'll just uh, miss some of those points out. <clears throat> Look, I'm going to talk about HR, because don't expect recruitment in Australia to be easy. Recruitment's not easy anywhere, but you're in a market you don't know that well, and there are cultural differences. We do speak English, but we communicate quite differently, and at times you would think we're speaking a foreign language the way we communicate, and it's really important to understand that. Finding people that fit your business culture and your team culture has worked for us, and that's worked for us over and above finding someone with the best skills per se on paper. A fit for your business culture and a fit for your team is, is paramount. But what I, what I do have to say is there are cultural differences between the way New Zealanders and, and largely, not all, but by and large, Australians treat work-life balance. And I think you have to understand that and embrace that and acknowledge that to be successful. Labour costs in Australia, we're picking somewhere between 15 to 20 per cent more in terms of actual labour costs in Australia, and that just is what it is. You have to be prepared to front that. Tyranny of distance. It is so geographically challenged. You need to consider your distribution models. Distribution to us is what we do. We need to distribute product every day to everywhere across Australia. We had two distribution centres, we brought it back to one. We gained more efficiency, we gained cost savings, and we lost nothing in terms of being able to offer good customer service and good die fots delivered in full on time numbers. So that was really important. Don't be afraid to have a central based system. 
Managing teams remotely is a massive challenge. So you have sales reps out there, you've got teams out there. They're out there on a big land. And you've got to think about how you're going to keep them feeling engaged, how you're going to keep them feeling loved. What we've worked towards is providing support in the, in the base office so our senior managers can get out there and spend time with them. Nothing like getting your managers out of their offices and into the cars or into wherever, wherever your staff may be to show them your care. If you're just sitting in your office and you're only picking up the phone, that only goes so far from, from our experience. You've really got to get out there. So you have to provide support so your managers can get out there. Don't be afraid either, I think, to pick a state. So if you're in the dairy industry, obviously Victoria, Tasmania is an obvious place to start. And take small bites of the elephant. Don't be afraid to, 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 to start your business in a state or a couple of states. Try some pilot schemes and if they work, expand to the next most likely geographical areas. You know, you don't have to take Australia on all in one fell swoop because it can be daunting, it can be challenging and it could run you aground. So working, and we've done it with some of our product ranges, we've said, hey, let's just start in one state, let's see if it works. If it works, let's expand it. It's worked for us, it may work for other people out there as well. <coughs> uh, finally, tech transfer on farm. You know, in New Zealand, we're extremely lucky to have um, real accessibility to direct to the farmers and to, to the farm stores and have that science extension linked so well so if we need to tell our story, if we need to launch a new product, if we want to talk about a new innovation, we've got farm store publications, we've got widely available rural press options, we've got um, great science extension with the likes of Dairy New Zealand, we can tap into those. Australia is a little more challenged in that area. The infrastructure isn't quite so tight, the extension on farm isn't quite so good, and the access to media is a lot more expensive and there's no one one go-to magazine or paper you can go to to reach what we can reach in New Zealand. So you need to think about how are you going to reach your target market. Really important, costs some money. Um, look, all in all, Australia has been a massive challenge for our business. It's taken us, you know, we've been there now 16 years, but it's worth it. If you can crack it and crack a few of those small things, the reward is there and, and we've absolutely really enjoyed what's come back since making a few of those changes in our business model. Thanks guys. Thank you. Fantastic insights John, uh, wonderful to get that practical on the ground uh, information, really really good. So look we're going to move from our, our closest market to probably our most furthest away market. Dan Taylor is going to come and talk to us, the uh, returning trade commissioner from UK and Ireland. He's going to talk to us about uh, the snapshot for the UK and Ireland. Thanks, Dan. Great, thanks Mike. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, given we've only got five minutes to cover the UK and Ireland, it's going to necessarily be a pretty high level overview. Um, I'm not going to, to use any slides, but I'm more than happy to um, talk in a bit more detail later. We've got UK and Ireland on, uh, on the screen here, and uh, I think it's an important point to note, um, first off, that while there's a lot of similarities in those markets, they are quite different propositions, and it's really important that if you're thinking about entering or growing, that you think about them as their own markets. Don't lump Ireland in with the UK, um, mainly because it pisses off the Irish. Um, in both the UK and Ireland, agriculture has a really long and storied history. It's, a, it's an important part of their economies, and that's particularly so when you look at the devolved administrations of uh, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, and then of course the Republic of Ireland. Um, and so the, they have, um, they, un, not unlike us, they have a real empathy and a feeling for um, agriculture as a important part of what makes them who they are. Their systems are similar, but they're not identical. Uh, and that's another really important point. So use the similarities, but don't, um, don't forget that there are, there are differences in the way that, um, that these markets operate. 
Traditionally, we've seen both the UK and Ireland have really small land holdings. Um, average um, herd sizes measured in the tens rather than the hundreds. And that has a real impact. It means that technology is less invested in, um, simply because economies of scale are not able to be achieved. We're seeing some real changes in, uh, in that in both the UK and Ireland. We're seeing consolidation of these small land holdings um, into much more commercial um, operations. And so suddenly technology uh, is is proving advantageous in a way that it hasn't previously. We're also seeing a generational change in those who are running the farms. We're seeing uh, sons and daughters take over from their parents uh, and these this new generation of farmers have grown up with technology they expect it to be part of their business um, as well as their private life and that plays I think really well into, into New Zealand hands and we'll hear a bit more about that later uh, I'm sure those uh, younger farmers also travel uh, and a number of them have done seasons here in New Zealand and so we have to use that we have to use those people to people connections we have to make um, use of the fact that there's a real warmth towards New Zealand and its farming practices um, in those markets even though they might be a long way away. I think the other key factor that's driving a lot of the change in the UK and Ireland is a, is a move to productivity and efficiency um, in a way that we haven't seen um, in, in decades. Uh, and that's, that's partly um, because of the more commercial focus that we're seeing, um, but there's also some broader um, contextual elements, um, Brexit being one of them, that is meaning that these, um, these farmers are having to change the way they operate. Uh, it's a given that there will be a change in, um, in how subsidies are managed in that part of the world, and um, so that means that farmers are not going to be able to rely on other sources of income as they have done previously. They're going to have to get it off the farm. And so I think that that is a, is a real plus for, for New Zealand and, and what we have um, to say. In support of that, we've got a great reputation. Um, in both the UK and Ireland, we're seen as um, not only good farmers, but good custodians of the land as well. Um, and that's something that we share with, uh, with UK and Ireland farmers. Um, and so that, I guess that willingness to understand what New Zealand has to offer and how it applies in a UK and Ireland context, you're pushing on an open door and it's something that we need to make the most of. That said, um, there needs to be a commitment to these markets. Um, these are not markets that you can manage by flying in and flying out. Uh, you need to have people on the ground who are there and able to respond in a timely manner. We talk about uh, the tyranny of distance. Um, that's that's not going to change. New Zealand is not going to suddenly get any closer to the UK and Ireland, so it means that our companies have to find a way to manage that, and the way to do that is, is boots on the ground. Understanding your own value proposition is obviously really important, but you need to be able to understand that from a market perspective. You need to be able to tell a great story about why your product or service is answering the problem that the farmer has in the UK or in Ireland. Um, and we've got a great story um, that will really um, emphasise that coming up. Uh, in closing, I'd just say that these are, these are really important markets for New Zealand. They're markets where we've got a long history um, of providing quality. Uh, the keys really are, and they haven't changed um, since that first boatload of, uh, of frozen beef went over 100 years ago. You need to plan, then you then need to execute, and that will lead to success. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Look, um, we're going to get Andrew Cook from Rizar Systems to come up and talk to us about uh, his experiences in this market. And Rizar have recently opened up a, a an office in the UK, um, and and these guys have a very very good background in developing bespoke systems and software solutions for farming business and agribusiness. So, look, Andrew, please love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And. Uh in the keeping with boots on the ground, I'm wearing my boots today. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to endorse some of what Dan has said. Um, Rosier has only been working in the UK since late last year, and so in one sense I find that I'm hardly qualified to talk to you about it. In another sense, we've been working in the UK since 2011, um, and, uh, and in two, different, two completely different modes. So from 2011 we worked opportunistically 
UK companies would come to New Zealand, they'd come to the field days, they'd look for interesting things and they'd come across us and they'd get us to do a bit of work. And that's all well and good, and, uh, and some of those were good lucrative contracts for us, but extremely hard to manage, hard to manage the follow-on activities, and always dealing with that time zone challenge. Um, and uh, and it, it's rough actually asking your customers to stay up late at night for a business call or get up early in the morning. And they're used to doing it a little bit with Europe, but not to anywhere near the same extent. Um, so having somebody on the ground uh, has been great for us and we've seen just a, a huge lift and response to that. Uh, the other thing I think I'd say is um, in terms of where the UK market is at, and we didn't talk about telecommunications and those sorts of things, Dan, but um, uh, you know, we have benefited from, benefited from that investment in infrastructure, even though we complain about it in the rural space in New Zealand. Uh, you get a little way off the beaten track in particularly Scotland or Wales and you're looking at no bars, no coverage, no Wi-Fi and an incredibly slow home connection. And it's what they're used to. Um, uh, but things are changing and they're changing rapidly and the UK government through a number of means is making huge investments in technology, huge investments in infrastructure and huge investments now in agricultural <coughs> technology and looking at how they can lift the efficiency and productivity of the UK farming. And, and, and Dan's right, Brexit is going to drive that at an incredible rate um, and we're going to see some big changes. When we started to work in the UK, we were warned that um, Europe sees New Zealand as a low-cost producer, not as a technology base. And so, and I know that some New Zealand companies who are trying to sell products in that market have definitely found that to be a challenge, that we're not recognised brands over there. For us, we're working in the services space, and, uh, and it is in some ways quite different. Uh, our customers are businesses who are themselves developing products to, to promote or maybe they're trying to create new services to help farmers be more efficient or more effective. And New Zealand's legendary efficiency is actually a real string in our bow, it's, it's what people like. Uh, and so uh, we've found our very open arms. We also have an Australian subsidiary and one of the big differences we've noted is here in New Zealand, most people, if they don't know you, will know somebody you know. Yeah, it's our two degrees. In Australia, they'll hang the phone up on you. Don't need to talk to you, click. Even if later on they realise actually we did need to talk to you but we didn't realise it at the time. Um, my experience so far in the UK is look, everyone's incredibly happy, let's have a cup of tea and sit down and have a chat and it can be very hard to distinguish what's a real lead, a real opportunity and what's not and we're looking at how we can better understand that at the moment. Um, logistics is a challenge. Yeah. Uh, the ag industry is very fractured in the UK. Apart from the, the major supermarkets, everyone's a small player. Uh, and even the big feed and fertiliser and other companies are small on our scales. Uh, which means investment is hard to justify. Uh, and it means you're travelling to them, they're all scattered around the country and fantastic roads but still long, long journeys. So a whole heap of interesting logistics things to think about for us who are used to doing business in our relatively small ecosystem. Um, and I think that's probably, that's probably all I need to say. I would say for us it's been really great working in that space with New Zealand Trade and Enterprise because between the NZTE staff and the Beachheads advisors, advisors, they get this. They understand that market and their advice on approaches and what to do and what not to do so far has been invaluable. So, thank you. Well done Andrew, thank you very much and uh, for those insights, very valuable indeed and we'll come back to questions later on. Uh, across the Atlantic now we're going to get Paul to come up, Paul Vaughan to come up and talk about North America. Uh, Paul's a regional manager here but, um, but he knows everything about the world so that's great Paul. <laughs> so, 
How does this little buzzer work? Is it that way? Right. So I'm just going to use a whole lot of slides to give you a picture and a story of North American dairy. I'll try and rattle through them in five minutes. So this is where it all started in the States, the Dairy Belt. Um, and a lot of you know the states, know that um, a lot of their activity is still based in Wisconsin, up in the north, uh, which is where their World Dairy Expo show is, and it's still one of the largest milk producing states. And we've traditionally had a business development manager based up in New York because that was the heart of dairying. The other the curious thing about that is actually that's the coldest part of the United States. It's also the freeze zone, so that's one of the reasons that the cows don't go outside in the winter, because it gets very, very cold. There's been a bit of a change over the last 15 to 20 years and you can see there that the biggest producing state by a long, long way is California. Um, and uh, Texas, I think, if we did that, that was in 2014, I think now this year Texas is in the top five as well. So there's been a big shift of production from that um, northeast towards the west and that's where the big, big units are based, the 24 by 7 uh, farms who use rotary systems and bits and pieces but not much is based on grass. So milk production, that's what it's been doing in the United States, it's been climbing quite rapidly and they're now actually an exporter and a competitor of New Zealand for exported dairy products. Um, and as you can see consumption in the States has been rising but not really as rapidly as has been their production which is why they've now got to think about exporting which is putting some pressure on the industry because it has to export but it's not necessarily a competitive industry. And that's a very sad story, that's American milk consumption. So a lot of the dairy industry in New Zealand is based on exporting, always has been on powders, but in the States, a lot of it was based on supplying liquid milk for the retail sector. And so that's, that's gone down and that's caused lots and lots of issues for US farmers who are producing milk for liquid consumption because basically there's not much being drunk anymore. So they've got some big issues. Uh, Dairy consumption is falling. You've all heard about the alternative plant-based milks, which are very, very popular in the States, and they're increasing rapidly market share. And that has led to this overproduction because unlike some other countries, there are no production caps, so they can produce as much milk as they like. Uh, and so they're probably producing way more than they need, and so they're starting to export. They've got some trade policy issues. Their biggest export market is actually Mexico, who they're seriously pissing off at the moment with Mr. Trump. Um, so I don't quite know what's going to happen there. Um, and they're seriously banging on the doors of Canada because they say the Canadian system is very unfair and they'd like the Canadians to open up for America. And I don't think that's going to happen in a hurry. Uh, back on the farm, they've got concerns about animal welfare, sustainability. So that's pushing actually a nice trend which could help New Zealand towards farming more on grass, more naturally, and also to organics. And there's some regulations in the states which ensure that organic farmers actually do have cows outside on the grass for at least part of the year, um, which is a, it's going to help some of our technologies. Profitability, four years of low prices, so grass farmers are supposedly um, surviving better than the guys who are on um, what they call TMR, total mixed rations. Uh, but I actually rang up ahead of this, I rang up a, a good friend of mine who's in Georgia and is in charge of ag extension in Georgia, which is according to the USDA the most profitable region in the states to farm because it's mainly on grass. He says in the last three years 20% of the dairy farmers in Georgia have just walked off the land because they can't compete anymore so they've either gone into beef or they've just closed down. Um, Aging farmers, so you've got the same system that you've got happening in um, in Ireland and the UK, that's leading to lots and lots of consolidation and bigger units, so I guess that's one way for them to become more competitive and, and stay in business. And as we heard before, obviously a lot of emphasis on new technology with these younger farmers. You know, we've got all these devices which monitor cow performance uh, and lots and lots of data for the farmers to use. Um, that's an interesting graphic that actually shows uh, how high your percentage of feed is as a percentage of your budget and you'll see that in these new regions they're really really dependent upon feed, imported feed for their animals and that poses challenges when feed prices go up but at the moment they're relatively low so they're quite competitive. In the older states up in, up in the northwest that's as I said where the grass-based farmers traditionally were. 
Um, organics, as I said, they are obliged to graze outside. So we've had a bit of a focus on trying to get New Zealand technology out to those organics farmers. Um, I think some of it's f what you might call faux grazing. So they go outside and stand on the grass, but they don't actually eat much, and they go back inside and eat their rations. Uh, but certainly there is a move, and as you can see, some of them are quite large herds, California 511. Back in the northwest, the area we were talking about, northeast, sorry, still pretty small herds, 60, 56. So like we were talking about Ireland, their ability to invest in new technology is quite low because they just don't have the money to invest. <coughs> Um, and finally, just a picture of US farms. That one on the left is what they call a free stall. So that's about as free as the animals get. So they can actually move around inside. Um, and the ones on the right, that's the traditional form of farming. It's called a tie stall. So as you can see, they're actually tied up. And they don't move very far. And they might actually be milked in situ. So they're, they're not exactly like a New Zealand cow. They don't move very much. Um, and that's the milking systems, not the same as they are in New Zealand. Those ones on the left, that would be a, a big system, it's called a, it, it's called a parallel system. Um, huge amount of labour involved in those systems, not as efficient as a rotary, but that's what they like. And the ones on the right, those are those poor cows in the tie stalls, so you can see they haven't moved very far, um, and they're being milked exactly where they live, which I, I regard as totally inhumane, but that's how apparently most of the farms are. And that's what they call a CAFO. So that's a concentrated animal feeding operation. That's a Californian beef farm. Not quite like a New Zealand no, operation. Yes. <laughs> Not quite like a cafe. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, sorry. Oh, that's it. Your that. timing yeah. is impeccable. How about mate. that? That was perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Paul. We're going to get an industry perspective now from Stephen Hoffman. He heads up uh, Gallagher International's uh, sales and marketing team. So. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Look forward to your insight. Thank you, Mike. I guess Gallagher have been operating in USA and Canada, but particularly USA, for about 40 years. So William started the business up there with some independent distributors that was marginally successful. Um, those that paid us were successful. The ones that didn't were the ones that weren't successful. So about 25 years ago, we formed a joint, joint venture company up there with a partner, and uh, we were a minority shareholder. And that was kind of the start of the success of the business. Uh, they created a brand awareness for us in the rural industry. And then uh, about eight years ago, 2010, we uh, bought out our partner and it became a fully owned subsidiary of which um, I'm now responsible for. Getting involved, so and I've been travelling up there personally for uh, around 25 years. I currently go up uh, four or five, maybe six times a year because it's already been pointed out, same as some of the other markets, uh, immersion is important. I don't want to live up there full time, but you sure as heck can't run a business in North America from a Pacific island somewhere down in the bottom of the world that the American, average American doesn't care about. The other thing I've found is if you think about USA as one market, you're likely to get distracted and not be successful. USA is not dissimilar to Europe. It's lots of little um, states in their instance, and they are quite different. Their language is often different, their socioeconomic um, positions are different, their religions are different, their language, although it's based on English, I can't understand a word my staff out of uh, the, some of the southern states say. So it's quite, quite different, and I think that's really important. So. Um, if you move up there, it's, it, it, you need to think about where you want to go, and I think it's already been said by somebody else, it's about um, bite by bite, just handling it as one big um, market really, uh, you're going to struggle with that. The other thing to remember is that a farmer in USA grows crops. You know, you can any way you like. That's what a, if you're in a, if you're talking to some American people about a farmer, they grow corn and all the other crops that go with it. Um, Livestock farming is quite different. Animals, uh, from our perspective, they, they, they're born, they stand on the grass until there's a spot for them in the feedlot, and they go to those feedlots that, um, that you so rightly pointed out, Paul. So from our perspective, from a Gallagher perspective, ours is about a partial farming solution. So um, we've had to figure out how to do that. In markets like New Zealand and Australia, we have the privilege of having some really good resellers. We know them as the farmlands, the PGG Wrightsons, the farm sources, and they focus on supplying the needs for those grass and farmers. In North America, those those businesses don't exist. Um, I go and, and we sell through some stores who are uh, enormous square footage in, in towns and of that square footage maybe five or ten percent of that square footage is devoted to farm and ranch supplies. So when 
make an appointment to see those dealers either at a head office level or at a, at a store level, we're a long way down the priority list, no matter whether it's electric fencing or whether it's anything that supplies those livestock farmers. So pushing yourself to more relevance, becoming more important in their business is, is, is critical and don't underestimate the challenges involved in actually doing that. The other thing is uh, being New Zealand based is not always an advantage. You know, we're good at what we do, absolutely we are. But if that's not the farming style that's that's uh, being operated or the management style, then all of a sudden we're res less relevant. And they are very parochial. They absolutely are. We have some competitors up there who, uh, frankly, their product would never survive down here, would never make it. it. It wouldn't. And yet they do quite well up there. Their competitive advantage tends to be price, and they, they exaggerate the performance of their product, which does our category harm long term. So we have to take on board the responsibility to, to try and improve that. That's also difficult. A lot of the dealers, the resellers, to get this distribution, they, they, don't, they don't have representative servicing them and helping create demand. They tend to do most of their buying at buying shows. Often they belong to an umbrella organisation and those umbrella organisations put on shows that the vendors go to uh, for a year. And so the dealers come along and buy all of the goods they might need for their store for the next uh, four months. They all get shipped to them. and. The whole process is repeated four months later, which is very different to the drivers that we have down here. Um, the other thing is the, the local people, if you get involved with them, most of our staff, 99% of them are, are American people, they are great people. They are hardworking, they're intelligent, they're really smart. But in order to be able to motivate them and to understand their world, again, it's about be relating to them, not expecting them to just think that, that we're the greatest place to do business with. Uh, the weather, the weather in North America is a challenge. Um, at the moment, they're just moving into their summer. Um, most of the states went straight from winter to summer. They had no spring this year. That's a real challenge for a lot of farmers up there and um, you have to be able to understand that it's not as dependent as it often is down here. The other thing which uh, we've certainly found important, and again it was mentioned by other people, being committed to the market. You're going to go up there and you're going to make some promises and you're going to talk to some people, important that you follow through. If you don't follow through you'll do New Zealand Inc more harm than good and, and I've had it related to me by a number of um, potential customers up there, and I'm talking about distribution customers, that they've been frustrated with businesses that have turned up there, promised the world, create this um, story and then don't uh, follow through. So important that you, you make a commitment over a period of time. And I guess the last thing I'd add is um, they love our accent. Use it to your advantage, because I sure as hell do. <laughs> Fantastic, Stephen. <laughs> wonderful, Stephen. Thank you for that. They do love the accent in North America. There's no doubt about that. So look, wonderful insights there as well. Moving into South America now, we're going to talk to Bre Brenda Mars, going to come and give us an overview of South America. Um, so, Brendan, thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Brendan Ma from New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. I'm our market manager for South America. Uh, buenas tardes e bon dia. Um, South America, it's a bit different to the others. It's a huge continent. Um, just some quick stats up here from an economy size and country populations. You got Monster there in Brazil with 207 million people, uh, GDPs of 1.8 trillion dollars uh, down to Peru with almost 200 million um, 200 billion dollars um, GDP quite a range in GDP per capita um, so you've got uh, Argentina and Chile Chile the leader in the in the in the continent for GDP per capita um, but what I would comment on is countries like Colombia Peru have been growing quite had strong economies over recent years growing at three to five percent year on year growth so they've seen a real movement in that sort of uh, from the low social economy into the medium um, middle consumer and that's driving demand into better products and quality of life um, one factor i will talk about here is the ease of doing business this is a a good indicator um, some of these markets aren't easy uh, just commenting brazil is a big one but ease of doing business 125 in the world it's, it can be quite difficult and that's one of the challenges you'll face whilst uh, countries like chile colombia peru are really trying to increase their regulatory and, and country environment for making it a bit easier to do business um, just stepping across the continents uh, the continent here Argent, uh, the whole of South America is what you call a big food bowl. It's a huge, agriculture is a huge part of their economies. 
be it coffee, be it soybean, be it uh, maize, um, beef production. Milk, milk's big in some of the countries, further down south in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, um, and the south of Brazil. Um, but across the agrotech scope, there's um, it, there's just a lot of opportunities if your product isn't just focused on dairy. You, you know, there's some big industries there as well. So you're looking at you know three three and a half to twenty one percent of their, their GDP is based on agriculture businesses. Um, so it's 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 just it's just monstrous the size and the numbers um, and the land scale there as well. Just to step into a couple of markets to give a bit more of a snapshot. Um, using here Chile and Argentina is a bit of contrast. Chile, as I said before, GDP per capita is quite an advanced um, uh, economy in South America. Uh, it's also its dairy industry has quite a, a bit, had a bit more investment or investment uh, over recent years. And there's just a small area in the south of Chile, which is almost like walking through the Taranaki or the Waikato region as well, and that's where the, the dairy industry is based. So you can see there are 2.7 million head of cattle, there's about half a million um, dairy cows. Um, you know, not a huge production, litres of milk production, 2.5 billion litres of uh, milk produced in 2016. Um, farm sizes, you're getting a bit more of those uh, more intensive farms, 100 head more or more, around 76% of the industry. Uh, and it's a bit more focused, the industry, you know, it's a bit like the, the distances aren't as huge as some of the other countries. Whilst on the other hand, looking at contrasting to Argentina here, uh, 52 million head of cattle and only 1.7 million in the dairy industry, so the beef industry is huge. Um, and they use a mix of pasture based and intensive feeding because these countries are big producers of soy and um, maize production. Um, big milk production there, 9.9 billion litres of milk. Um, and you, again, you've got that 82% um, of farms with 100 head of, of cows as well. Um, one of the countries that I don't have here is Colombia. They're at a, a, a different stage. The, you'll probably see in their percentage of farms, it's, it's in the smaller size and that sort of one to 50 animals per farm. But you seem to see countries like that consolidating and farms growing a little bit more. So the scale of these industries is sort of sort of changing and, and developing. Uh, opportunities for agritech up there. Um, big things, productivity and efficiency. You've got small farms and they're growing into bigger farms. And it goes across the whole value chain. Some of these farms, if it rains, you can't, you, you, the dairy tankers can't come in and collect the milk because it's not uh, asphalt rolls, it's, it's dirt. Um, parts of Argentina, you're only about a metre above sea level across the whole of the Pampas. So they've had some flooding issues, which then creates issues of logistics of getting you know, the, the milk out of farms. Um, the dairy producing uh, processing companies are really after that quality control, so they're really looking at their extension or the programs they can put in place for their farmers um, to you know increase the quality of their milk production. Um, an issue for some of them is access to capital. Um, dairy is not in some of these countries a wealthy industry, so they don't have a lot of money to invest back in their farms. Uh, and some of the governments are looking at better incentives about how they can access funds or investments into the farms. Uh, whilst in countries like Chile, you've got a bit more investment at the high end, and they're really investing into that high end, you know, milking platforms um, and, and equipment to really can to, to increase the productivity and efficiency. Quality of labour is an issue in a lot of these farms. A lot of the people who work in the farms don't have a formal education or they don't have a qualification from a technical side. So there's a lot of work around how you can upskill the farmer, um, the workers on the farmers, on the, on the farms, uh, how you put a qualification system around them so they've got a bit of a technical qualification they can use. Um, but whilst in some of our markets, some of our agritech companies, they've invested in their staff and got them up and then they're seen as quite, quite good employees to headhunt from other companies. So there's a retaining of um, quality staff is another issue for some of these countries. Um, free trade agreements, we've got in early 2019 probably CPTPP rolling out, which will be implementation, which brings online a free trade agreement for Peru and Mexico for New Zealand. Uh, what we have seen in our experience in Chile, which we've had a free trade agreement since 2008, quite a bit of investment in from New Zealand into Chile, and that agritech story has really grown in, in depth. Um, and it's probably the most advanced market. We've probably got 30, 30, 30 to $35 million of agritech investments going across to Chile, whilst these other countries are around four to $5 million of um, agritech investments or exports per year going on. Um, 
And, and you're seeing from these countries, they're trying to make themselves more globally integrated. So they've opened up free trade agreements. You've, you've heard already about the Trump effect and you know a lot of the Latin countries got together and they're, they're really going outside, trying to open up new markets for themselves, talking to Europe, talking to the Pacific region, uh, which brings opportunity to open up and open these markets. Um, barriers to entry. Um, Yes, there's language issues. Most most less South American countries are Spanish speakers, and obviously um, Brazil being the largest is Portuguese. Um, but I don't think it's a necessarily a barrier. Um, you're more important is the quality of your local partner or your distributor in building the really strong relationships and help train those staff up or the, their sales reps or who's working for you over there, and they're the ones that go out. So it's, it's building those links. It's it's important to know language and an appreciation for it, but I don't think it's a it's a, a real tripping point. Regulatory concerns. Um, usually, it's 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 a little bit difficult to maneuver in this space and understand the regulatory concerns. And then there's another process, which is the bureaucratic process of actually getting stuff done if you have to get certification and things like that. And so sometimes that can take a lot longer than you expect. Um, in most of these markets, you'll find most of your global competitors there, or there'll be local producers or suppliers. Um, and so you just got to get a, a bit of a map of who else is out there when you go across. Um, general market entry tips, uh, probably a, a similar theme that we've heard from the other markets. Take some time to understand the markets, don't think of them as a whole country. Like I say in Chile it's basically a couple of provinces down the south that you want to focus on, or in Uruguay there's a couple of areas there. Um, do it bite by bite um, and, and spend some time to do some desk research, go across, walk some of the big shows and get a feel for what's happening in the industry there. Um, we talk about some of the markets are a bit easier to cut their teeth. Um, most of our companies have, have learnt, learnt their business in Chile and now they're looking to expand themselves into these other markets. Um, and that's, a, that's a, usually a good opportunity to, um, or a path to market is to cut your teeth in those markets where it's a bit of easier doing business is easier uh, and the systems are a bit more advanced. Um, and as probably we've heard here, key partner selection is a, is a critical, critical factor for your success in these markets. So that's a real quick snapshot. Um, I'll pass over to Mike to introduce our. Thanks, Brendan. Here. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Brendan. <laughs> Look, we're going to hear from Peter Van Elzaka. He's from CRV. He's a global product manager, born and raised on a well, raised on a dairy farm in the Netherlands. Went to Wagen University and he studied at ag economics and breeding. So look, thank you very much for coming along, Peter, and talking to us about your experiences. Thank you, Mike. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, CFV is a herd improvement company, um, and uh, the main uh, product that we export is uh, genetics, dairy genetics. And that's really the focus for us. Um, before the start, uh, Mike and Brenda would, and I were talking, and uh, I said it was an advantage to be last. Um, I find out it's not, because uh, we've covered everything that I was going to say, so we're nearly done. Um, what that tells me, and I, I think what I should tell you, is that uh, the country that you go to doesn't really matter, the principles are the same. So uh, I guess that's a, that's a big lesson. Um, yeah, you have different language, you have different circumstances, but the principles are all the same. So I'll, I'll uh, go over some of the things we already discussed quickly and uh, see what we haven't covered. Uh, do your homework. Uh, I guess that's, uh, um, it sounds easy. We tell our kids they have to do that and they still don't do it. So, and I'd say there's be many companies that make the same mistake. Um, we, we work closely with NZTE and, um, and uh, uh, that's been mentioned before too, they're really valuable, uh, add value for us um, and uh, uh, one, of the, one of their projects and uh, one of the ways they help is uh, through Better by Design um, and uh, we, we did a design sprint in Chile for instance um, and that was really really useful for us. We, uh, we did it after I'd been involved in the market for at least three years and um, we were very, uh, we were amazed by how much we learned from, from that experience and I guess it tells us that uh, you, you have to listen to customers um, and you have to uh, really delve into that, uh, into that customer, find out what their needs are and, and what you then ex uh, find is that um, in your home country, here in New Zealand, we, we, we see benefits for our products and uh, we, we can rank the benefits and you can assume that those benefits are the same or are, you can order them in the same way overseas. But what we found in Chile is that that's not the case and uh, that's why you have to do your homework um, and you have to do that in every market. So that, that's important and uh, um, some of those changes uh, have to do with culture and you have to just accept the culture. Um, 
It's, uh, it can be extremely frustrating, um, but the culture is the culture and you have to work with it. Um, if you try to work against it, uh, you know the outcome. Networks, they've been also mentioned, um, very important and it is important to immerse yourself in the marketplace. Um, I've been involved with the South American market now for six years. Um, I, I live here, um, I don't speak this, the, the language. Uh, but we, we needed to be there and over the last six years we've actually put more resource into the market there. We have uh, two people now based in the market, uh, one's in Brazil, one's in Santiago. Uh, they both speak the language and they are both there on a continuous basic basis dealing with the various countries. And um, well, by doing that we've seen, we've seen the advantages and we see our, uh, uh, our sales grow. Um, you have to have patience. It's, it's not instant uh, and, um, and, and that's where uh, there's culture. Um, when you look at our products, um, when I look at the benefits, um, South America, most cows are outside and they're on grass or something that looks like grass and therefore our grazing genetics have a benefit. The culture and what people have been, uh, been trained uh, over the last 15, 20 years is, is very much uh, looking and listening to North America. And, and that you don't change that overnight. Uh, that takes a lot of time, and um, and well, yeah, sometimes it can take a generation. And we don't have that much time, but that's just where patience comes in. Listen, listen, listen. That's a big one. Um, do a lot more listening than talking. Uh, I've been blessed with two big ears, so I've got an advantage. Um, but it is it's it's key. Yeah? You've got two ears, one mouth, and use them in that order. Um, the language bit has been uh, talked about and, and again I can't reiterate enough uh, that it's very important to, to speak the same language and I don't speak Spanish fluently. Um, when, I, when I went to Chile I found out that German helps and I've, I've been in meetings where we speak English, German and Spanish and it works. But even if you think you're speaking the same language, um, sometimes you're not. And, um, I have contact with uh, our, my colleagues here. Have contact with uh, colleagues in Holland, and we 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 call their English Dinglish because Dutch English is very different from English or New Zealand English. So you can't re uh, I can't iterate that enough. Um, so yeah, using all these kind of things, uh, we've seen our uh, our sales grow, uh, and we've doubled it over the last three years. So uh, I guess if you learn and uh, and do all these things, you get there. Thank you. Fantastic, Peter. Thank you. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I've got time for one or two pressing questions. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to suggest that you can catch up with any of these wonderful speakers over drinks and canapes outside. But, um, but are there any pressing questions? Any questions anyone would like to answer? Anyone on the panel? One quick one. If it's all the same, I don't, have we thought enough about cross-cultural differences? We talked a lot about how, I think, you know, market infrastructure is the same, it's about relationship building, it's about knowing your customers, but having a strong story. How much do you need to account for how you modify the product for the market? How you modify the product for the market? Who would like to have a crack at that? Industry people, NTTE? Because if it's all the same, then, is it all the same? <clears throat> well, it's not all the same, is it? Yeah. Come on, you guys, what about your commercial guys? You know how to tailor it for the market? I think the key is um, talking to your customers um, and finding out um, the problem that uh, they are looking to solve. Um, and so what that suggests is that um, as a business, you're not leading with your solution. You're understanding what the problem is and then tailoring it to them. So absolutely, it changes on a market-by-market market basis. A lot of the stuff we've talked about today is <coughs> really high level. But when it comes down to that actual sort of product hitting the market, then you cannot just being off the shelf solution. So are there any examples in the room right now where you might have changed something for North America versus Chile, Canada versus Chile, UK versus America? Um, I can talk from uh, South America. Yeah. I mean, we just look at some of the collateral our companies use. Mm -hmm. The look of a dairy, of a, fat, a cow in Brazil doesn't look like a cow yet. Yeah. So they've had to use totally different look for cows. They've had to adapt their products to that market. So what we talk a lot about in South America is adapting your product to the markets because just using dairy based systems, it's, it's, um, it's adjusting to it. And it's good that Peter talked about a piece of work that we've done with him, which is that <coughs> empathy, which is actually going right down to farmers. And we took samples of like, um, you know, 
farmers that have subsistence farms that only have one or two cows, right, to big commercial sized farms, and getting a lot of understanding in there, and that's that's then used for our companies to to change how they actually pitch their products or their solutions into the market. So yeah, it's it's it's, it's really understanding that adaptation and, and in, in the environment. You know, because I, um, I'll get, you know, in New Zealand we don't realise how lucky we are. I always talk about the strength of New Zealand's system is the ecosystem around farmers. Everyone talks about our farmers being good, but I can go to my small town of Waipakarau, I can, I can get everything I want for my farm, whether it's merchandise, advice, support, you know, whether it's an animal health, products, um, you know, anything I want I can get, you know, within, you know, it's there in the, in the town for me that day. That doesn't happen hardly anywhere else in the world. So you need to think about that in the context of... I can put a slightly different perspective on North America is a good example. Yeah. We didn't just adapt our product to fit the needs of the North American livestock farmer because the needs they had were tainted by the local product and the local product is marginally fit for purpose for the style of New Zealand farming or pastoral farming that we in New Zealand and Australia and parts of Europe. So we've had to do two things. One is try and develop the farmer's knowledge of how to make money uh, by using the New Zealand low cost system as opposed to the system that they've traditionally used but at the same time to ensure we had enough revenue to be able to sustain the resources that that requires in the market to do that development. We've also had to lower our sites, if you like, and sell some products in the market that have been designed specifically for them, and other otherwise we, we just take this premium position with this premium product and grab them whatever we can that passes by. So ours has been a, a two-fold strategy, get them in with our brand awareness, get them confident in our quality and our delivery and the fact that they're going to be around for a while, and then use that to step them up to the product that's going to help them be more successful in their farming operation using the methods that we know down here. Fantastic. I'm getting the call from Nastasia that we need to keep moving. So uh, Miriam, sorry if we can just please ask anyone. But can I thank all of our wonderful speakers, uh, the wonderful team from NZTE, the, the wonderful industry contributions we've had. Uh, very stimulating. I know we ran slightly over time, but look, huge amount of information. We've traversed the world nearly uh, as far as AgriTech's concerned. Do your homework, immerse yourself in the market. Um, We've filmed this and it's going to be available at some point. Wonderful. Peter, it's going to be filmed and available. Uh, so look, there's a lot of common themes that have come out here. Thank you very, very much for your attendance. Please enjoy some drinks and canapes outside and catch up with these wonderful speakers in your own time. Thank you very much.